हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू द ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर इम्तियाज हसन फ्रॉम जामिया मिल्ला इस्लामिया आ सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन मॉड्यूल कन्फॉर्मेशनल चेंजेस हेलिक्स टू क्वाल ट्रांजिशन इफेक्ट ऑफ टेम्परेचर एंड सॉल्ट अंडर द पेपर टेक्निक्स यूज इन मोलिकुलर बायोफिजिक्स पार्ट टू आफ्टर दिस लेक्चर स्टूडेंट विल बी एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ प्रोटीन स्ट्रक्चर एंड कन्फॉर्मेशन देन वट आर द डिटर्मिनेंट्स ऑफ प्रोटीन फोल्डिंग then we talks about the conformational changes occurs in the protein structure then we especially discuss the heat induced denaturation and chemical denaturation and at last we talks about the helix coil transitions so first we discuss about the three dimensional structure of the protein what is the meaning of protein structure so let's start from the very beginning that the protein are made of the 20 different types of amino acid that are linked together in a linear fashion by a peptide bond the peptide bond allows for rotation around it and therefore the protein can fold and orient the r group in the favorable positions and this favorable position is adjusting towards the energetically favorable conditions the weak non covalent interaction which hold the protein in its functional shape these are all though these are weak but it holds the shape of the protein and the side chains will help to determine the conformation in the aqueous solution to the protein so the final shape of the protein or final structure or final conformation of the protein is called the native state of the protein which has the lowest free energy possible you can see here in the diagram that linear amino acids are joined linearly in the form of a string and then these amino acids goes to some secondary structure like alpha helical and the beta strands and the side chains are protruded out out from the main chain conformation and which helps to fold the protein from its linear conformation to the well defined three dimension structure that's the native state of the protein the peptide bond constrains the polypeptide chain the peptide backbone conformation can be described in terms of two dihedral angles that's known as phi and psi the phi is the dihedral angle between the n and c alpha bonds while the psi is the dihedral angle for the c alpha and c bonds the phi and psi values can vary and their rotation allows the polypeptide chain to adopt their various structure such as alpha helices beta sheet etc here we discuss about the ramachandran plot which is the graphical representation of phi and psi value of a polypeptide chain you can see here in the x axis phi values are given from minus 180 to plus 180 while in the y axis it the psi value is given from minus 180 to plus 180 the ramachandran plot indicates that the secondary structure of protein is totally depends on the phi and psi values and you can see here the region where the beta sheets are formed in this combination of psi and phi values similarly left handed alpha helix and the right handed alpha helix are formed in their corresponding region however the other way of the presentation of ramachandran plot is in terms of allowed and disallowed region so the only certain values of phi and psi angles are allowed you can see here in the red and yellow region which is the allowed values of the phi and psi psi however the white region does not allow the formation of second district in the protein and this kind of conformation not possible this kind of combination of phi and psi value is not possible here we discuss about the secondary structure in protein the two regular pattern have been identified formed from the bonds of the peptide backbone the first one is the alpha helical conformation which is formed by the hydrogen bond between every fourth peptide bond between of the co and nh usually in proteins that expands in the membrane the alpha helix can either coil to the right or the left can coil around each other and coil coil shape a framework of the structured protein such as nail and skin the kind of alpha helical conformation are found 
The other secondary structure is the beta sheet, which is generally found in the core of the many proteins. It forms the rigid structure with the hydrogen bonding. It can be of two types. One is the anti-parallel, which runs in opposite direction to its neighbor, while the other is the and parallel beta sheet which runs in the same direction with longer looping sections between the them. Here we discuss about the beta turn. The beta turn you can see here in the structure. It is a formation of hydrogen bond between the first and I plus 3 amino acid residue. It connects two other secondary structure elements causes a backbone to reverse direction a four amino acid loops reversing direction 180 degree and amino acid and hydrogen bond formation between co and of the first amino acid and nh of the fourth amino acid amino acid 3 is often glycine which is a small flexible while the amino acid 2 is proline whose cis conformation turns tightly usually it occurs at the surfaces and connecting anti parallel beta strands there are different types of the beta turns named as type 1, type 2, type 3 depending on its conformation. Here we discuss about the energy landscape of the protein folding. You can see here in the energy diagram the protein is in the disordered structure, is having the large number of conformational ensembles which proceeds towards the formation of a well-defined three-dimensional structure which having the minimum number of conformation and minimum energy. The protein folding proceeds from a disordered state to progressively more ordered conformation corresponding to the lower energy levels. There are more ways of folding. The same protein can acquire more conformation. Alternative conformation are presented by local energy minima. Here we discuss about the determinants of the protein folding. The protein folding is determined by a large number of parameters. One is the peptide bond dynamics that can decide the what kind of secondary structure achieved. Then hydrophobic collapse that the hydrophobic residue allows the linear amino acid to form a fold a collapse a structure with the minimum volume. Then the local second structure formation occurs because of the phi and psi value of the protein of the peptide backbone and that's caused the formation of either alpha helical helix or beta strands. Then the topological organization is also essentially important for the folding of the protein and at the last the structural consolidation such as space packing directed mainly by the internal residues Protein structure are hierarchically organized, structures are highly adaptable and secondary structure can be context dependent and changing the fold of a protein. Here we discuss about the different types of non-covalent non interactions. These are the ionic interaction which is governed by the electrostatic forces and it's exist in a length of 1.8 to 4 angstrom generally 3 to 10 angstrom for the like charges and its energy is 1.6 kilocalorie per mole and the residue involved in the ionic interactions are positively charged such as lysine arginine histidine and the negatively charged residue are aspartic acid glutamic acid the other force is hydrophobic interaction which is entropic in nature and its strength is 2 to 3 kilocalorie per mole. The residue involved in the hydrophobic interaction are methionine, isoleucine, leucine, valinine, phenylene, tryptophan, tyrosine, alanine, cysteine, and proline. Another important interaction is the hydrogen bonding, which lie which exists between 2.6 to 3.5 angstrom, and its bond energy is 2 to 10 kilocalorie per mole and it is based on the hydrogen bond donor and acceptors. The other interaction are the Van der Waal interaction which may either be attractive and repulsive depending on the distance but although its energy is very low but the number of Van der Waal interactions are very high in a protein. Other two interactions are aromatic 
pipe pipe transitions or aromatic amino group are the hydrogen bonding these are the rare interactions and found in the proteins here we discuss about the protein solvent interactions because the folding of protein requires the solvent it occurs only in the water so the hydrophilic and hydrophobic residue played significant role in the protein folding the hydrophilic amino acids such as aspartic acid glutamic acid lysine arginine histidine asparagine and glutamine tend to interact extensively with the solvent in context of the folded protein the interaction is mostly ionic and hydrogen bonding there are instances of hydrophilic interaction residue being buried in the interior of the protein often pairs to these residue from the salt bridge the hydrophobic amino acids such as methionine lysine valine lithiumine isoleucine leucine valine phenylalanine tryptophan tyrosine alanine cysteine and proline tend to form the core of the protein that is these are buried within the folded protein some hydrophobic residue can be entirely or partially exposed in the protein however some neutral amino acids such as glycine alanine serine and theonine are lesser preferred for being solvent exposed or not here we talk about the disulfide bond which is the covalent bond formed within the protein and mostly most important interaction for the stability of the protein it is formed by the oxidation of the two cysteine residue and that interact in a way to form the covalent bond the most disulfide bonded proteins are extracellular such as lysozyme which contains four disulfide bond and the conditions inside the cytosol are reducing meaning that the cysteine are usually in reduced form cellular enzymes such as protein disulfide isomerase assist in many proteins to form the proper disulfide bond now we talk about the conformational changes in the protein structure in some protein the binding of ligand or the other protein can lead to the dramatic conformational changes such as the binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin is a well known example that induces the conformational changes in the protein under physiological condition of solvent and temperature all the molecules with same amino acid sequences acquires the same native state and some other protein acts as a pump or motor all those changes in conformation like the myosin of the muscle atpas gro el gro es a change in the secondary or tertiary structure of a normal protein without alteration of the primary structure the biological function of protein is depending on its three dimension structure you can see here in the diagram that the protein is in the particular conformation but binding of some ligand opens this conformation and made it to the active state of the protein so these are the two different state of the protein you can see here we discuss about the significance of the protein denaturation the protein denaturation is used to understand the mechanism of protein folding is used to estimate the thermodynamic stability of the protein sometimes used for the solubilization of the overexpression of the protein and of course to improve the stability and function of the protein you can see here that in the extreme of condition the normal protein converted into denatured into the unfolded protein that is known as denatured protein and sometime it is the this process is the reversible so if you remove such conditions such as uh, denaturing agent extreme of ph temperature ionic strength it be, it is denatured into the normal protein now we discuss about the process of the denaturation it is a phenomena that involves loss of 3d structure of protein which is sufficient to cause loss of function of the protein and that's what this process is known as the denaturation it occurs suddenly and completely over a narrow range of the conditions protein can be denatured by several means and the most important is the temperature which causes the unfolding of the protein and which in turn lead to the aggregation the temperature actually increase in the temperature causes the loss of the non covalent interactions such as hydrophobic interaction van der waal interaction and the hydrogen bond interaction other 
denaturants are the extremes of pH. As you move towards the extreme high pH or extreme low pH in both the conditions, the protonation and deprotonation of occurs and that changes the charge state of the protein and thus leading to the structural changes in the protein and of course it leads to the denaturation if it goes towards the extreme end. Another important denaturants are the chaotropic agents such as urea and guanidinium hydrochloride. These are the highly potent denaturating agent. Then the uh, detergents can also used for the protein denaturation. Then some organic solvents such as alcohol and cross-linking agents are also causing protein denaturation. Heavy metals such as lead and cadmium are also used for the protein denaturation and at last oxygen radicals ionizing radiation these are the agents which causes the permanent damage to the protein and of course it is the denaturation so now we talk what are the consequence of the denaturation on the protein structure simply the denaturation leads to the loss of secondary structure the far uvcd spectrum of the protein changes so called the melting temperature and the loss of the secondary structure can be estimated in terms of the melting temperature as we increase the temperature another way around the fluorescence characteristic will also likely to change so the loss of tertiary structure is estimated by the fluorescence characteristic or the far uv and the near UVCD dichroism spectra also used to estimate the, the spectral changes and of course the TM value of the protein. So a loss in the activities also occurs during the denaturation because the activity of the protein can be monitored over the time and that a loss in this activity clearly leads, help you to estimate the loss in the structure of the protein and of course denaturation. And at last aggregation that's uh, can be estimated by the light scattering such as 320 nanometer and by spectrophotometrically or by detecting the protein in the precipitate you can visualize the precipitate as well. Here we talk about the protein stability and how the protein stability can be measured. The net stability of protein is defined as the difference in free energy between the native and denatured state. Both native state and denatured state contribute for the delta g value of the protein the free energy may be readily calculated by following a simple relationship k equals to concentration of native uh, divided by concentration of unfolded protein equals to fraction of native folded native protein divided by one minus fraction of native protein so Delta G is simply is the free energy values of the native state minus the unfolded state which equals to minus RT ln K. K is the equilibrium constant between the native and unfolded state of the protein. So decreasing the energy of the folded state or increasing the energy of the unfolded state have the same effect on the delta G. Here we discuss that how the transition between the two types of secondary structure occurs from alpha helical to beta sheet. You can see here the starting point is the natural protein folded in the native and active conformation and normal protein is rich in alpha helix conformation and conformation changes lead to the formation of the beta sheet and this is involved in some disease associated proteins such as leads to the aggregation, gain in toxic activity and loss of biological functions. Now we talk what are the techniques used to measure the protein stability. Simply any method that can help to distinguish from the unfolded state protein to the folded state of the protein is used to estimate the stability of the protein because it is the simply the equilibrium state we should measure the equilibrium state between the unfolded and folded state of the protein for this first method is the absorbance which is based on the absorption of tryptophan and tyrosine so in the folded state and the, in the unfolded state the absorbance characteristic of a protein is dramatically changed and uh, these value as used to estimate the protein stability the second is the fluorescence tryptophan fluorescence is dramatically changed if the protein denaturation occurs there are two ways either the intensity is decreased decreased 
or the other way around the shift in the lambda max both parameter are used to estimate the protein stability by using the tryptophan fluorescence measurement other technique is the most commonly used the cd spectrometry for which the far uv cd spectrometry is used to measure the secondary structure of the protein and the near uv cd is used to estimate the tertiary structure of the protein and thus you can see the near uv and far uv cd spectra of proteins in the native state or in the denatured state is completely different and that the difference is used to estimate the protein stability and the most advanced technique is of course nmr that you can see that is used to estimate the native and unfolded state of the protein and the last one is the dsc it is the best on the calorimetric change or heat capacity of the protein the other methods are like the urea gradient gel that used the to estimate the difference in the migration rate between the folded and unfolded state under the urea denatured state sometimes catalytic activity is also used to estimate because the unfolded state is the enzymatically inactive and the folded state is enzymatically active and the gradient between the folded to unfolded is proportional to the catalytic activity of the protein and at last chrome 4 and fluorophore probes are used to estimate now we talk about the equilibrium unfolding many using many probes to investigate the number of transitions during unfolding and folding for a two state unfolding all probes give the same transition curve and single domain or small protein usually have two state folding behavior for three state unfolding there are more than one transition or different probes have different transition curves this is the basic difference between the two state and three state folding you can see from here in the graph that in the top panel you can see there is an unfolded state and there is an as a folded state so there is a simple one transition from the folded to unfolded but in the lower case you can see there are many transition states that it suggests that it is a three state process that having many intermediate states now it talks about the molten globule state it is much of the secondary structure that present in the native protein which forms within the few milliseconds this is called hydrophobic collapse or sometime it is known as molten globule state the molten globule state have a characteristic feature like it is slightly 5 to 15 percent more larger than the native conformation of the protein and it having significant amount of secondary structure however the side chains are still not ordered or the packed properly and structural fluctuation is much larger not thermodynamically very stable you can see here the unfolded state of the protein at the extreme left and at the extreme right you can see the folded state so there is a state exist in between these two states that is known as the molten globule state it is a short lived state it is exist only a certain range of the concentration of denaturants here we talk about how do we understand this equilibrium unfolded to the folded state and we simply derive in terms of the value of delta g this is the depending on the concentration of the unfolded state and if the k equivalent is more than one it means the reaction is favors towards the folded state k equivalent is less than one then the reaction is favors towards the unfolded state and k equivalent one means the mixture of equal mixture of folded and unfolded state the same thing is decides the value of delta g that if delta g zero is less than zero means reaction favors folded state the positive delta g favors the unfolded state and delta g at zero is the equal mixture of unfolded and folded state two state unfolding of the protein so the k equivalent is decided by the denaturing of the protein and the increase for example here we show that the, by increasing the temperature or in the right panel you can see by the acid or the guanidinium hydrochloride the change in the optical properties is governs the fraction of the unfolded state and this fraction can be fitted into the equation given here that k equivalent equals to native divided by unfolded state 
in terms of theta or theta values obtained by the circular die crosses. So that helps to calculate the k value and ultimately leads to the estimation of delta g value. Here we talk about the denaturants used to estimate the stability of the protein in terms of delta g value. It is common to extrapolate the data of unfolding transition as a function of denaturant to zero molar which gives the value of the delta g value in the water means delta g zero or you can say the delta g water. So the delta g water is simply the delta g value minus m is the molarity of into the denaturate concentration and delta g value is about to minus 5 to minus 10 kilocalorie per mole. However, the method of extrapolation some error may occur. Here we discuss about the heat induced denaturation. The heating disrupts the weak interaction in the protein especially hydrogen bonding and abrupt loss of structure and function over a narrow range of the temperature and thus abruptness suggests that the cooperative process. So heating or causes the denaturation from folded state to the unfolded state while the cooling causes the renaturation from unfolded to folded state. So the unfolded state having high entropy and few stabilizing interactions are there while in the folded state low entropy and many stabilizing interactions are there. Here we talk about the heat induced denaturation where the heat is used to estimate the stability of the protein and you can see as you increase the temperature the property optical properties got changed the example of the absorption we are the another the example of uh, the other technique that the fraction unfolded similarly the dsc is also used to monitor the heat induced changes and this technique this equilibrium folding equilibrium can be estimated monitored by absorbance fluorescence circular dichroism fluorescence and isotropy and sometimes measuring the enzyme activity let us discuss differential scanning calorimetry it measures the simply heat required to raise the temperature of solution especially macromolecules relative to that temperature required for the buffer alone so it is obtained by subtracting the two large number means the heat required to increase the temperature of buffer alone and buffer with the protein and that difference is actually the heat capacity of the protein so dsc can is measures the heat capacity of the protein and dsc can be used to directly estimate the enthalpy and melting temperature of the thermally induced transition and also it is used to estimate the tm value it's the melting temperature of the protein so the temperature melting temperature is defined as the temperature where the 50 percent of the protein exists in the native pro state and 50 percent exists in the unfolded state and for a delta g if the value of the delta g is zero it means the reaction is in equilibrium means enthalpy delta h is equals to t delta s it means the entropy and enthalpy are equal so the delta g zero is means that the reaction is at the equilibrium condition you can see here the differential scanning calorimetry how the differential scanning calorimetry is used to estimate the delta g value and here you can see the delta cp value is measured as the area under curve now it talks about the chemical denaturation both the guanidinium ion and the urea are roughly triangular and planar organic molecules with one central carbon carbon atoms in urea the oxygen carries a partial negative charge and the nitrogen carry partial positive charge in guanidinium the net positive charge of the molecule is disturbed is distributed by resonance over the nitrogen attached to the carbon the native conformation are generally stabilized by, the, by their lowest energy relative to the typical energy barrier. You can see here in the diagram the structure of the urea, the structure of the quantitative chloride and the structure of the polypeptide chain and then you can easily understand how the open conformation or the unfolded conformation 
is converted into the three dimensional structure so the how the urea disturbs and the guanine is hydrochloride disturbs the unfolding disturb the folding process of the protein so it's experienced the high energy high entropical ensemble of the non-native conformation here we talk about the possible mechanism of chemical denaturation that the burial of hydrophobic amino acid side chain in the protein cores are both driven by the hydrophobic effect and each phenomena is crucial for the stability or low entropy folded state the importance of solvation to protein structure has been identified as a possible explanation for the effect of denaturation denaturants co-solvent weakens the contribution of hydrophobic effect to energy change favorable electrostatic interactions between co-solvent molecules and the polar atoms in the protein that become exposed upon the unfolded energy are stabilized by the non-native structure here you can see the model where the gonadinium ion exhibit a pronounced tendency in the simulation to acquire the flattened conformation in the proximity of hydrophobic surface here we show that the, how the denaturants bind to the protein and co-solvent that decides the denaturation of the protein it is an schematic illustration of preferential binding and preferential hydration by solvent additives in preferential binding the additive occurs in the solvation cell of the protein at a greater local concentration than in the bulk solvent however in preferential hydration results from exclusion of the additives from the surface of the protein here we discuss about the calculation of the folding free energies by using the denaturant and the a plot can be obtained by using the denaturant concentration versus the fraction of the unfolded and that simply uh, the equilibrium between these two states can be used to calculate the free en energy of the protein and the conformational entropy contributes significantly to the expansion of free energy and hence also free energy of the unfolding because of urea and the quantitative hydrochloride what is the meaning of unfolding transition curve the unfolding transition curve have the three regions first is the pre-transition region which shows how y value of the folded protein yf depends on the denaturants the second is the transition region which shows how y varies as unfolding occurs and the third is the post translation region which shows how y of the unfolded protein yu varies with the denaturants here we discuss about the behavior of the denatured protein you can see here the in the in the protein the hydrophobic things are inside the core and the hydrophilic things are at the surface but once the denaturation occurs some hydrophobic content of the protein are exposed and that leads to the formation of hydrophobic interactions and thus the denatured protein forms the aggregate and the denatured protein are non-functional because of improper interaction non-productive interactions which causes aggregation and it is targeted for the proteolytic degradation as well here we describe the helix coil transition it is a measure of relative fraction of the molecule in an alpha helix conformation versus the turn or the random coil you can see here the alpha helix it is a characterized by common rotating pattern keep together by hydrogen bonding while the coil state is the conglomerates of the randomly ordered sequences of the atom and the theta value is depends on the order parameter of temperature for the helix coil turn. as we increase the temperature the theta value lowers down it means the helix structure lost into the coil here we talks or about the estimation of the helix to coil transition it can be used as a alanine polypeptide model or by increasing the temperature which is monitored as a absorption or as a CD theta value so these are the different techniques available to estimate to estimate the helix to coil transition in the different proteins so students let now summarize that what we learned in this module the two amino acids are joined by peptide bond which determines the higher level of structural organization of the protein 
and the native conformation of the protein acquires as the consequence of interaction between the side chain of the amino acid of the polypeptide chain occurs and the chemical denaturants have served for many years as an effective means to disturb the protein structure and to study the sequentially reverse process of the unfolding and thus to estimate the stability of protein or estimate the Gibbs free energy of the protein. The denaturates induce, induces dramatic transformation of the unfolded state and driving from a globular to coiled state of the protein. Urea and GDMCL are the weakly interacting molecules and molar contractions are required to induce denaturation. Classical mo models proceed that chemical denaturation operates either by binding directly to the protein or by modifying the properties of water solution. And folded proteins are marginally stable. The hydrophobic effects plays a huge role in the stability of folded state of the protein. Thank you.